Great. Today's webinar is aimed at primary practitioners and it will look at practical classroom ideas for promoting the linguistic development of advanced English language learners. If there is time at the end, um, Tom, our speaker today, will also take any questions that you may have. So please feel free to use the Q&A box to send any questions as they come to you during the webinar. I will collect them and post them to Tom at the end. And in the next couple of days, you will receive an email from us with a recording of the webinar and also any links to resources that Tom will be mentioning during his talk. But enough of me now. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Tom Beeks, uh, a trainer at the Bell Foundation. So over to you, Tom. Thank you, Shaka. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our webinar today. Um, it's um, great to have so many people from different places joining us. And um, I just want to give you a bit of context for this webinar, which is that um, this came out of um, a set of webinars I did earlier this year, which was talking about using the assessment framework, um, the Bell Foundation assessment framework for schools to assess the language levels of more advanced learners. Um, and in that webinar, my intention was to talk about um, assessment, but also apply it to uh, strategies and techniques that we can use to develop language but it quickly became clear, clear that I'd bitten off more than I could chew so I want I thought I would um, split those two topics up and um, rather than covering both assessment and strategies in the same webinar um, I've created a separate webinar so we can concentrate entirely on uh, strategies and techniques and activities today um, for developing the language of primary learners and here's what we're going to do today um, first, I'm going to talk about why um, it's important to support more advanced uh, plurilingual learners that we work with. Um, we'll look at some of the characteristics of these learners and their language um, and how this might inform our choice of support strategies. And we're going to learn also um, about some practical examples of activities and task types that will um, help develop the language skills of our more advanced plurilingual learners. And I'll be giving you examples both from the Bell Foundation resources uh, free on a website and from other sources as well. And I'd be delighted if you want to share in the chat your own ideas as we go through. Um, it, it's great to get um, to hear what people are doing as well. Um, and the impact we hope this will have is a to make you as practitioners more confident in adapting and designing curricular materials for your learners, um, especially your more advanced learners and to allow them to better access the curriculum and achieve their, their academic potential. Um, I also want to say that whilst this webinar is for anyone who works with more advanced EL learners in the classroom generally, I've deliberately chosen strategies and activity types that can be used by any teacher, not just by EAL specialists or language specialists. So there'll be, I've tried to choose task types that could be beneficial um, to all kinds of teaching staff. Um, so uh, let's start by establishing why it's important to focus on these more advanced learners of English. And um, the first thing to I want to show you here is um, this is a, a diagram showing the five proficiency bands used by the Bell Foundation Assessment Framework for Schools. And these were originally created to be aligned to the descriptors used by the UK Department for Education. Um, and research carried out by um, Steve Strand in Oxford University and his colleagues um, tell us that learners operating at band C and above on average achieve above the UK national, lang um, national average academically. And this goes across year groups, it goes across subject levels. Um, and I think what this tells us is that um, it's important to keep offering that support beyond that C level developing competence, which is where often um, children are taken out of targeted support and tend to be placed into mainstream lessons if, if, if your school does has that system. But if we really want them to achieve their potential, then we need to keep providing that support because what this data suggests is that the higher the language proficiency of our learners, the better they achieve academically. Um, so we owe it to them to make sure that they uh, become as proficient as possible during their time studying with us. The second thing we can look at as well is 
time to progression. This is how long it takes learners to develop from being new to English to being fully proficient or fluent. And again, some research um, from Steve Strand and the University of Oxford gives us a pretty in solid indication of how long this takes. So to go from band A, which is new to English, um, to reach band C, which would be fluent, takes an average six or more years. Um, and although this is based on data from the UK, um, I think from personal experience and from working in other context, um, this seems like a reasonable estimate for many of our students. Of course, all students are different, so we need to bear that in mind as well. And there will be there will be a range of different um, speeds as students progress. Um, and again, this shows us that more just two years or so of focused input um, is not enough. We need to keep continuing this throughout the child's academic career. Secondly, I think it's important to recognise that acquiring a mastery of academic English is vital for academic success and it needs to be taught explicitly. Um, and again, we need to reinforce this message to um, our colleagues, to school leadership and parents that a couple of years of intensive language support is not sufficient to achieve mastery of academic English. And some level of support will be needed even for competent and fluent learners if they're gonna achieve the language level that will allow them to achieve their potential. Um, exposure alone is not enough and it doesn't just happen. So hopefully we can agree, it's useful to provide support for our advanced learners. Um, but I think it's also important to recognize that the kind of support that they need is gonna be different. So let's look at some of the characteristics of higher proficiency learners and the types of language that they need to develop. So I'm gonna show you a section from the Bell Foundation Assessment um, Framework for schools. Um, actually, I, I would like to do a quick poll in the chat box, can you, type yes in the chat box if you know about the framework and, you, and you've used it before um, or, you, or you're just familiar with it. Um, and no, if this is the first time you've ever heard about it and you've, you've no familiarity with it at all. Okay, lots of yeses coming in. That's good to know. All right, excellent. Well, that means you have some sense of what I'm talking about. Um, if you haven't used it before or don't know what I'm talking about, that's fine. It doesn't, it, the webinar won't be focusing um, specifically on the framework, but I will be referring to it throughout. Um, and um, if you're not familiar with it, it looks like this and it provides 10 descriptors for each band um, for the four different skills levels, um, skills areas, sorry, which are listening, speaking, reading and viewing and writing. Um, we're going to be focusing on what the descriptors at band C to E say about what learners should be able to do, okay? So when I'm talking about advanced learners, I'm, I'm using it in quite a broad sense of kind of anyone from band C, which is developing, developing competence up to band E. Um, and I've tried to select strategies that I've mentioned that can be used by anyone, whether you're a language specialist or whether you're a class teacher or a subject teacher as well. Um, this is particularly because, you know, as we know, as students get more uh, fluent um, and their competence increases. Um, so increasingly language and support comes from class and subject teachers, not just from the AL specialists. Also, I think for primary, we do need to define what we mean by advanced, um, especially when we're talking about lower primary or early years, okay? Um, I think the main thing to point out is that the foundation, the Bell Foundation bands encompass an enormous range of child development at primary level in particular, because we're talking about perception all the way up to year six. Clearly, that's a gigantic um, leap in child development. Um, and this means that it's likely that most younger children, regardless of proficiency, are going to find it particularly hard to move beyond, say, band C um, when we're talking about reading and writing in particular. Um, now this doesn't mean that you should be ignoring bands D and E um, in terms of assessment or setting targets um, because children are all individuals and there will be exceptions but you shouldn't feel that something is wrong if no child is moving beyond say a band C in their um, kind of lower primary years. Um, in, in fact a child whose first language is English is unlikely to meet many of the band D or band E descriptors 
um, I think at, at a lower primary level and certainly at early years, simply because you know they won't be writing yet. Um, and um, just developmentally, students will need to be older in order to meet some of the higher uh, descriptors because of the nature of them. And, and our experience working in the UK with teachers using the framework is that um, band C is a pretty reasonable writing target for children at the end of year three. So just bear that in mind when we're talking about um, strategies. Um, and for that reason, many of the examples we will be looking at are for learners at more of an upper primary level. And there is a reason for that, which is that when we're dealing with more advanced learners at early years or lower primary, I think most of the most effective task types and strategies are those that we hopefully are already using with our um, fully proficient um, or first language users of English. Um, you know, good early years teaching is naturally a good fit for learners using EAL because of the scaffolding um, and the techniques that are used. Um, that's not to say I won't be mentioning the younger ages at all, but just I'll be focusing more on kind of upper primary, especially in terms of the resources. So if we look at the framework, we can notice that the lower bands, then the criteria has certain characteristics. The lower band learners, um, the language there we're helping them with is is tends to be at the level of words, sentence, or paragraph. It tends to be specific language items or structures. And there's lots of examples there in the descriptors which help us. Um, and this makes them, I think, easier to notice and assess as well as address. At higher levels, it's a little bit trickier, I think, because the descriptors are necessarily broader and they tend to refer to the level of the whole text or discourse, if we're talking about spoken English, rather than individual vocabulary items. Um, references are, uh, more abstract and broader and um, they tend to talk about for example functions of language that could be realized in a whole different host of ways rather than they can just be listed in a short descriptor and they will tend to include examples rather than of individual items of vocabulary or structures they'll include examples of text type or genre so story science report letter presentation and so on. And again, I think this can make it daunting to set targets and potentially to choose strategies to support these higher band learners. Um, and particularly that's true, I guess, if you're not a language specialist, and you don't have that, um, that background. So in light of the nature of these descriptors, let's look at some of the key strategies that we can use to help develop these higher band learners and their skills. So I've identified three key strategies here um, that will help support these learners across the different language skills, across the four skills. And then for each strategy, we'll look at some concrete examples. So the first strategy, and this is the overarching strategy, is to maximize the opportunities for learners to use target language. Um, like all skills, language only develops through usage. And we're gonna look at ways to adapt tasks to increase opportunities for language use, manipulation, and experimentation, because this is how the going to really beef up their language skills. Um, by target language, for those of you who aren't perhaps um, EAL specialists, what I mean is the language that we want our learners to be able to use to achieve a given task um, within the lesson or within the sequence of lessons or curriculum that we're teaching, um, whether that's having a discussion or writing an, up an experiment or giving a presentation to our classmates or, or writing a, a test answer or exam answer or something. So um, in order to maximize these opportunities, we can combine this with two more strategies, and that is planning and organizing ideas before uh, attempting to speak or write. Um, and this is particularly important for more academic or formal um, activities in the classroom. And thirdly, learners need to see or here and have ready access to models of the language we want them to be able to use. So this means things like providing good examples of the text types we are working with, and they need opportunities to notice patterns or be directed towards the key features of these of this language that we want them to be able to use independently themselves. Um, these strategies can be used at the micro level and applied to a single task, or they can be taken more broadly to the macro level of um, applying to a sequence of lessons or even a curriculum. So whatever your role in your organization, I hope these ideas can be usefully applied. Um, okay, let's start getting 
practical then. Um, we've discussed the sort of theoretical basis for why we want to be doing these things. So let's look at how we can maximize opportunities for higher level students to use language in the curriculum. Um, the first thing uh, we need to do is ensure that there are opportunities for group and pair work discussion. This might sound really, really obvious, um, and hopefully it's something that you already kind of have well embedded in your teaching practice. But um, I think it's just really important because um, it kind of forms the bedrock, I think, of, of kind of solid um, EAL provision. Um, and a particular technique, which again, I'm sure is familiar to many of you, um, is this one of think where we set a task, but before we ask for a response, we get the students to think individually about what they're going to say. Then pair where they would discuss their uh, response with a partner. Again, giving them the opportunity to, to practice English potentially. Um, there's an optional third step, which is the square where the pair can then share their responses with another pair just to build up their, their ideas further. Um, and finally, share. So we have the think, pair, square, share, whether that's orally to the teacher or on a mini whiteboard or it, would, however it is you want to make it visible to you as the teacher, um, the students can then share their response. And um, this is a very useful model. Once students get used to this model, it can be used very efficiently and it's very effective for learners using EAL because it gives them thinking time, allows them to rehearse and respond with their peers without the pressure of doing it in front of the whole class. And it allows for peer teaching and peer support um, and ultimately will also ensure much better quality in the responses you get from your learners. Um, now, of course, this isn't something that's limited to advanced learners at all. This is something we can begin with our lower level learners. But it becomes very powerful, I think, when it's used with the higher proficiency learners because they need that extra practice. They need those miles on the tongue. So by developing this routine with our learners, we're helping them develop their language and supporting their curricular learning by making it um, easier for them to engage with the ideas and concepts, as well as providing them practice opportunities. Um, so, I mean, what does this look like in the classroom? Well. Um, with primary learners, how you set up your classroom, as we know, is really important and we can easily help allocate each learner um, a regular partner. Um, for example, I usually do this by marking on each desk a recognisable common vocabulary item, such as an apple or banana, so that when it comes to pair work, um, apples, we're doing a pair and share, apples can work with apples, bananas can work with bananas, so we have apple pairs, and banana pairs. And then if we want to practice something again with a new partner, we also have the opportunity to switch and we can say, okay, now apples to bananas, and then they can work in new pairs. Having these routines and systems, again, just makes it really much easier to maximize these opportunities for using language. Um, and um, I'll talk throughout the rest of the presentation about ways we can drop this in. So another way to maximize use of language is taking a task that might otherwise be an individual task and adapting it to provide situations where learners need to communicate with each other to complete the task. Um, and we can call these information gap activities. Um, and they do this by imposing a communication barrier. Um, so that is that one learner has information that another learner needs and vice versa. Um, and this obviously covers a very wide range of task types. Um, you can see our great ideas pages on the Bell Foundation website for more information about this. But um, let's look at a very basic example. Um, here's a barrier activity. Um, this is based on a history lesson talking about the Black Death in Europe. Um, and students would be split into pairs and each pair has a different map. So student A has map A um, with the information there. and student B has map B with the corresponding information and then students are able to share that information and again we can bring in our classroom management setting here so um, bananas can read text A, apples can read text B and then um, 
this can be very quickly set up, this kind of activity, if you have this kind of um, classroom management set up. Moving back to the activity then, the students would, um, in the, in the resources it's given on the website, the students are given example questions with gap fills like this. But for me, you know, this is, this is good scaffolding. This is great for our lower proficiency learners, but how would we want to adapt this for our higher proficiency learners to, to provide that level of challenge um, and focus on the language that they need? Um, so I'm, I'm going to ask you in the chat, can you give me any examples of how you might adapt um, these barrier game instructions and question prompts to make them more challenging for our higher proficiency learners? Okay, seems to be a lot of head scratching. Giving you thinking time, that's fine. <laughs> Unfortunately, you can't work with a partner to discuss your ideas in this particular case, unless you happen to be sitting next to a colleague. Okay. Okay, no, that's a good point um giving more making it more relevant to the students well yeah i mean that's certainly a choice of topic i think you're right i think if i was working with chinese students i probably wouldn't be talking about european um this context in europe um it does look well scaffolded that's my point but actually what i'm saying is we might want to um remove some of the scaffolding for our higher uh, level learners to help them <laughs> Yeah, okay, someone suggested removing the visuals. Yeah, perhaps. Um, so uh, I think that's, describe what's on your map. Yeah, more open-ended questions. Okay, excellent. So we're getting some really nice ideas. Um, okay, so I'm gonna just give you a couple of examples. Now these aren't necessarily the only ways that, to do this, but um, one, one thing that I think is useful, especially for where there's questions involved, is to provide um, the questions but mix up the word order. So for example, you might provide the students with a model question, sorry, like this. Um, and then the students have to work in, again, small pairs or, or, as, or as individuals, depending on how you, what you want. And they put the, they assemble the question from the, from the words. Again, this is focusing them on the correct word order, word, word order and grammatical structure, which um, can be, um, something that even higher level learners struggle with, especially with questions in English. Um, I think as somebody mentioned, we can also adapt this by um, letting them come up with the questions and language themselves. And the procedure might look something like, okay, well, what questions will you have to ask to get the information you need? You know, look at your maps. What questions will you have to ask to get the information you need? And then you elicit from the student. Um, The students write them down. Again, we can. This is an opportunity for us to think, pair, share kind of sequence. There, they have a bit of a chance to do it. You know, we're not asking them to immediately give us that information. They have a chance to think about it, and then we can elicit the questions from them, put them on the board, and then correct or add them as required. And then they can start the activity. Um, and then, yeah, absolutely. Then there's other tasks you could do and um, prediction activities and so on which could also um, um, you would also then use to work on with the text afterwards absolutely um, okay so um, this this kind of technique you know, I think prevents kind of the spoon feeding of information and it encourages learners to engage more with the meaning um, and the, uh, and the promote a deeper understanding of the information that that they're working with because they kind of have to think about it they're not they don't just have it there to uh, to use. Um, the example I've just provided is obviously would be used with an older group, um, so upper primary, because they, uh, with younger children, they probably don't quite have the um, cognitive uh, level yet to, to deal with something like that. But 
we can absolutely use barrier or, or information gap activities with younger children. Um, you know, even in year, early years, I've used them very successfully. And, you know, an example might be something like providing flashcard vocabulary. So we've got here the animals and the children have to ask each other yes or no questions, um, you know, to guess what the other person has. You know, does it have four legs? Can it swim? Can it fly? Um, these kind of activities can be done very simply and the children can can do them independently with each other once they've learned, um, once they've practiced it with the teacher and they know what to do. Um, so yeah, this is a principle that can be done all the way from early years. Okay, another example of an activity to maximize opportunities for using a target language is a jigsaw listening or a jigsaw reading activity. Um, so a jigsaw activity is essentially where individuals or groups of students are given separate texts or pieces of information. Um, they then um, work on understanding those individually or in their small groups, and then they come back together to share the information to build a bigger picture of the topic being studied. Um, this activity allows for discussion and sharing of opinions um, and promotes lots of other key academic skills as well. Um, so let's look at an example that, and, a, and a procedure that I found works well with kind of higher precision learners at, at primary level. So um, first thing to do is to choose a key text. Um, this should not be anything too long. So you're probably talking about something sort of four or 500 words maximum. Maybe if it's a video, no more than sort of two minutes. Um, and it should be ideally something that you'll be reusing and need the students to understand quite deeply because it does require a little bit of preparation. Um, the example here is from an upper primary history lesson about the Victorians in England. Um, and the text is uh, taken from a video on the BBC website. Um, but they also provide um, a transcript. So it could be used as either a reading or a listening activity. And the topic here, because it's a UK based website, is on Victorians in England. And once you've selected your model, then you need to create a list of comprehension questions with answers that can be found throughout the text. Um, here's some examples. But again, I think you want quite a, uh, for this task to work successfully, you want as many questions as possible. So probably talking about 10 or 12 questions if you can. Um, and then the next step is to create a note taking handout and there's an example on the screen there containing the questions. So as you can see, there are questions printed and there's a space for the children to write their answers. Um, so where the jigsaw part comes in then is that each question has a color assigned to it. So one way of managing this would be to put the students in groups and assign each group a color. So we have the red group, you're answering the red questions. The blue group, you're answering the blue questions. The green group, you're answering the green questions. So they go away. The children listen to or read the text and complete the notes. And remember, each child's only answering the questions for their color only. Um, and then if they're working in groups, they can check their answers with their partners. Um, and this color grouping technique is called rainbowing, okay? so we might um, have the red table, blue table, yellow table, green table. If you have a bigger class, you can have you know, more than one red group, more than one blue group, however, however you want to manage it. Um, and what this allows us to do is after the children have discussed and agreed their answers for their color group, we can then mix them up. That's why it's called rainbowing. So then you have someone red, someone blue, someone yellow, someone green on each table. And they can then share their information with the group. Okay, so then they would complete the note taking um, forms together by asking each other questions. They would um, verbally um, share their notes with each other and then complete the note taking handout so that everyone has all the questions answered. Um, so, thinking about this activity, then these children have um, listened to a text. They've had to um, answer questions on the text. They've had to talk about that with their partner. They then had to go into a new group and explain um, and answer questions about the text to a new group of partners and then listen and write down those answers themselves. 
So my question for you is, well, what kind of language skills or language sub skills do students need to use to complete this type of jigsaw activity successfully? What skills are they using? We think about it in terms of speaking, listening, reading and writing. Summarizing, that's a yeah, good answer. They're potentially having to summarize information. Mm -hmm. Building confidence, absolutely. Yep, I'm asking the right questions. Yep, comprehending. Um, scanning a text, potentially if it's reading, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Understanding keywords, yep, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, subject related language. They're gonna need to get the heads around, definitely. Okay, yeah, these are really good suggestions um, and I agree, yeah. There's, Basically, I mean, this I think is a really highly beneficial, um, a very rich activity from a skills point of view because it's requiring the students to practice several different sub skills, such as note taking, summarizing, collaborating, um, and recognizing and understanding um, longer texts. Um, and I think this, for this reason, this procedure is best attempted with kind of higher band, band D and E learners. Um, although band C learners can certainly do it as well, but they'll just need more time um, and it would require um, a bit more scaffolding with them. Uh, I think it's also an effective and worthwhile for proficient speakers of English, of whether it's their first language or their second language or their additional language, as a way of understanding and engaging with the meaning and structure of a text more deeply, which is why it's very helpful to use with text that I think are, are really important that we want our students to understand well and deeply. So um, I just wanted to draw your attention then to some of the descriptors in, in, the Bell, um, in the Bell framework that a jigsaw reading activity might help the students to develop. So if you are using this, the, the assessment framework, um, at band C, um, for example, it's gonna help students ask questions for academic purposes. Um, at band D, we're providing opportunities for learners to identify specific information um, and understand um, uh, identify specific information, sorry, when questions are provided beforehand. And also it's allowing them to recount information that they've learned potentially, um, depending on the nature of the text that might well be uh, to do with the time sequence, especially in a history context. And at band E, um, we can look at this um, descriptor. Um, there's a lot of questioning in this activity. So this is providing opportunities for learners to structure their questions correctly. Um, and of course we can check this and, and provide input uh, as, where necessary. So it's, it can help in a whole lot different range of ways. Okay, let's move on then to this idea of planning and organizing ideas. Um, and I think that, I guess, greater autonomy is the key idea behind this. Um, the more language that students have, the more independently they can work. And, and whilst these kind of independent learning skills, I think are usually associated more with secondary school and older children, again, we can start embedding these useful routines and habits at primary level. It's really gonna help them when they move up. Um, on a very simple uh, basis, I'm sure you've all come across these kind of activities yourselves, but um, graphic organizers are vital when we want to scaffold speaking or writing tasks. And this can be something very simple as I'm showing you here. This is from a um, uh, information report on mammals um, task from the Bell Foundation resources where they're talking about different animals, in this case, cats, and they just need to categorize bits of information into these four areas um, before writing a report on the animal. Um, so this simple act of categorization is, is quite powerful. Um, this is an example, the next example is taken from a maths task. Um, and 
this is uh, taken from one of our resources on using mathematical language with lower primary children. So it's quite basic. Um, you know, uh, we're talking about addition, sub subtraction, division, and multiplication. Um, and this organizer allows learners to categorize a range of vocabulary relating to um, addition and subtraction. Uh, so there's a, they're given um, uh, word cards and they need to categorize them in the right place. And you'll notice there that there, some of these words are synonyms for each other. So it's building that range of expression. So you know, they would put them into the columns like this. Um, again, they can do this in pairs, which allows them to use their English to, to do the task. Um, you know, potential for giving opinions, potential for disagreement. And so we're building those kind of discussion skills that the student will need from, from a young age. Um, and, as, and, and, and in fact, you know, to begin with, they may even do this in their first language, these kind of discussions. But I think as they grow in confidence and proficiency, we can introduce English phrases to help them. And eventually, you know, our expectation is that children do this kind of discussion only in English, especially if they're obviously, you know, higher proficient, have, have higher proficiency. Um, but bear in mind, we shouldn't expect students to do any discussion tasks unless we provide them with the language to do so. Um, and we're going to look, we'll go back to this maths activity in the next section to look at how we can build on this vocabulary development um, to, to develop their range of expression using other strategies. So, um, another or organizing uh, principle, I think, when we're working with whole texts is to include prediction tasks. Um, these are really helpful because they promote conversation and they help learners to bring to mind relevant language which will make the text comprehension much easier um, and they work especially well with visual things so you know when we've got video we can show them pictures we can show them videos we can show them um, um, clips whatever it might be of, of the text or the uh, video that they're going to be seeing um, but I think it's important to always include some kind of prediction task um, if we're wanting students to work with a, a longer text before they um, before they experience it. And of course, we can also use it, um, these kind of questions afterwards as well in the context of, well, what do you think happen will happen next? And again, this, these are just opportunities for students to use their language um, as well as develop their ideas. Um, remember that we said that at higher proficiencies, the descriptors tend to refer to language at the level of whole text. So we want then to focus on developing learners' abilities to create and understand these texts, as well as just developing vocabulary and sentence structures. So um, another um, approach, um, another task type that we often use for this is ranking and sorting tasks. Um, and here are some examples of these kind of tasks that might be used in a curricular context putting events into chronological order, um, putting actions in order for a process or experiment and so on. So again, I'm gonna throw this back to you because um, I'm sure you've done a lot of these things yourselves. Um, what types of texts or topics could you then use these um, sequencing and uh, these ranking and sorting texts, uh, tasks with? So, just put some examples in the chat if you have any ideas. Perhaps you've used these yourselves or perhaps you could just think of situations where you could use these. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly life cycles would work really well with this. Yeah, definitely. The water cycle, yeah. Maria's written Oreo writing. I'm not familiar with that acronym. I presume that's an acronym for something. <laughs> I get lost a bit with all the acronyms. Identifying patterns. Okay, so what what particular patterns and progressions are we talking about, Becky? So in what con in what subject or topic would you apply that? Okay. 
Um, okay. Oh, yeah, date. So I'm going to move on. And um, I think you can do this these kind of tasks with virtually any text, but at primary level, I think they're particularly useful at focusing on um, stories and narratives. Um, this could be fictional or non-fiction, um, and especially those texts with a clearly delineated sequence of events, such as somebody's life story. Um, as people have mentioned, processes and procedures, these are brilliant for, you know, um, whether that's things like water cycle, life cycles, science experiment. And finally, um, we can spoke on we can focus on spoken as well as written text. So, for example, we could provide a model conversation, um, and students maybe have to piece together a dialogue um, from the individual um, speech um, speech act in the conversation, and then they can. Um, that's a really good way of modeling uh, dialogues and conversation, and that we want them to have and to use in the classroom. Um, and I think that links us quite nicely to our final strategy, um, which is this idea of providing models and raising language awareness. Um, and again, this is really key um, with our higher level learners is to provide rich and varied models of language for them. And then to link that and make them aware of the language that, they, that we want them to use. So um, on the screen then, here is a list of pretty common, typical ways that we can provide language models to learners who are using EAL. Um, I'm sure we've all used some of these in some way or shape or form um, from very simple things like having a vocabulary list or glossary, um, word mat, sentence starters and sentence frames where we give students part of a sentence to complete, um, a substitution table, um, and then lastly, talking about working with model text. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but I think it's important to recognize that some of these strategies are more helpful with um, lower level learners, and some of them are going to be more um, useful when working with advanced learners. And some of them will require to be um, adapted. So let's look at some examples of what I mean. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on um, these areas in this talk because I haven't got time to talk about everything. So let's start with um, looking at sentence starters and frames and how we might wanna adapt or use those with our higher level learners. Um, now, I think we've all used examples of these in, in some contexts. Um, these, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So these sentence starters and using sentence starters and sentence frames will usually provide a list of um, prompts for students to use. And these are often placed into different categories to make them easier to remember. Uh, a common one in UK primary schools, for example, that you may have counted is VCOP, which stands for vocabulary connectives, openers, and punctuation. And, and the, the example I've put here, um, I just downloaded from a primary um, teaching website that you can see there. And I just Googled sentence starters primary and this came up, okay. Um, and what you can see is they've provided pyramid structures. So they've got different, they've provided sentence starters at different levels of proficiency. Um, go move, and as they go down, they get more complicated. And this seems useful, and I'm sure it is useful, but I guess my question, looking at it from the perspective of children who are using English as an additional language, is what might be some of the limitations or problems with just giving a child uh, a big list of um, vocabulary like this um, before they attempt to do a task, for example. Let's say we've got a big discussion task planned or a big writing task planned, and we say, okay, kids, this, was, this is going to help you. Here you go. Would anyone identify any problems with that approach? Yeah, I think um, that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so Louisa said they can be overwhelming. 
certainly if you look there there's a lot of there's a lot of language isn't there on that poster um obviously understanding the individual items of vocabulary yeah absolutely um and I have uh, Tara, it's a really good point. Yeah, complex to understand and applied context. And that word context is really important. So, yeah, I'm going to let's have a look at how we might develop this then uh, and adapt it for our higher level learners. So, the first, there, I think there are two limitations with that resource that I showed you. Okay. One is it's disconnected from curricular context. So, an alternative might be to use something like this resource, which has been designed for a science lesson about how plants grow. Um, but you can see here the structures and vocabulary items are embedded within a clear, clear curricular context. Okay, and this is going to help our learners because they may lack the breadth of vocabulary and the automaticity of using different grammar structures and understanding where words fit in a sentence um, that a proficient speaker is going to have. So decontextualized words and phrases are really much harder for them to, to work with. And I would argue they're not great even for children who have English as a first language because they're, they're just not it's not linking it directly to, to the con to a context um, and the example I'm showing you here then is for designed for lower proficiency learners so band our band a and b learners so here we've got a picture we have a sentence frame with two gaps and then we have a word bank with the words that the children can use okay so this is very nicely scaffolded but again we probably want to provide more challenge for our higher level students. So how would we adapt this? Well, this resource actually provides an adaptation for band C learners. Um, so here they have actually provided um, uh, a sentence with some gaps along with a word bank and a picture. And so the students would then um, put the words from the word bank into the sentence and the word bank is just general. It's not. It's not per sentence. It's for the whole thing. So there's a bigger choice there. So that it requires them to think more carefully about which words they're using than in the first example. But again, I think with our band sort of D or E learners, we want to give. We want to offer them perhaps greater challenge. So um, for this, for the, in this context, then you might just provide the word bank like this, and then the learners write the sentences to describe the pictures without any prompts at all. Um, so we give them the pictures because I think having the visuals there is really important, no matter what your language proficiency, because that's what's getting across the, the content. And then they can um, they can write their own sentences. And then they can, of course, peer check um, to agree on a sentence for each picture. And that can be shared with the group to for you to check to make sure that they've gone the right lines. We can go back to our maths um, for an example here, and this is using a substitution table. So these are like sentence frames, but where we give students a choice of language to use um, to sort of fit in a sentence. And as you can see, there's a, this is a kind of entirely non-linguistic substitution table, if you like. There are no written words. It's entirely numbers or mathematical symbols. Um, and um, if we've introduced our students to the vocabulary earlier in this lesson, then hopefully we've, they've got some synonyms for these different words and we want to get them to practice it. So um, we can provide them with a word bank and they can make um, sentences. Um, again, we, we want to extend the challenge. So you might want to provide the substitution table, but um, without the word bank would be one thing to do. So they hit students have to retrieve the sentences from memory. Um, so 34 minus 21 makes uh, it's about 13 or something. I don't know, I'm not a maths expert <laughs> and um this is uh and this is one way of reducing the scaffolding but again i think we can go further than this um and introduce opportunities for students to use more language um within the maths within this maths activity so for example one thing they could do is create their own maths problems for each other <clears throat> um using the language we've introduced them to. Um, again, we want to challenge the learners to use as much variety as possible in the vocabulary that they're using. Um, and we can use those words from the graphic organizer that we saw earlier. Um, another thing we can do is to get them to monitor the language they're using and reflect on it a little bit. So you might want to get them working, instead of working in pairs, they can work in threes and in each 
while the pair, while two of the students do the task, one of the students is a listener and they listen to the activity and then they can use the word bank as a checklist and they tick off all the words that they hear being used in the conversation. Um, so this is um, encouraging the students to broaden their use of English for a start. And it's also the listener is, you know, is listening and, and getting models of language from other students and hopefully picking up on new ways to say things. So um, again, this is this idea of um, reflecting on giving students opportunity to reflect on language models and notice language is something that um, is really important and I think is great to start early in children's development. Um, so another useful activity then for raising awareness, and this is especially good for, for grammar, I think, and, and text structure. So it works at both the sentence and the text level, and that's the dictogloss. So this is a type of dictation activity, okay, where students listen to a text and have to recreate the text by writing down exactly what they hear. And of course, this means they will listen to it multiple, they will listen to a text multiple times. A typical procedure then usually looks something like this. The teacher reads a short text on a familiar topic at normal speed. And again, it, it's important to know here that the topic should be familiar. This should be a text, this should be a topic that students have already been exposed to. So there isn't too much brand new vocabulary and brand new jargon and things like that, because that's going to be overwhelming. Um, I mean, you might be able to do that, get away with it with your very high, highest proficiency learners, but um, yeah, you need to, ideally this is on a topic that the students have already been studying to some degree. And then the learners are gonna listen and take notes uh, individually to begin with. And this might be repeated a couple of times. The teacher will then repeat the reading and the students can form pairs and share their notes building up the text some more, because obviously there's no way they'll have got everything in the first listen. So the second time they'll, they'll be able to add each other, they'll be add more to the text. And of course, as different individuals will have um, heard different things so they can build it up together. And again, there's a lot of opportunity there for communication. And lastly, the teacher reads the text a final time, again, at normal speed, and you could get the learners to form um, a larger group to produce a final written version of the text. Um, and of course the aim is to get as close to the original as possible. Um, and you would provide students with the model text at the end and they can check their version with the, with the model. Um, you may want to scaffold the first stage um, a little bit and repeat it a few times. So one way to do this is to give them a particular part of speech to focus on, for example, nouns, um, first write down the nouns, then write down verbs, then write down adjectives. Um, and um, this is only, this should be born, you know, this, is, this isn't just a standalone task, this is just a task to introduce students to a text. Once you have the text, you would then move on to do more with it, um, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but again, we can look at the framework descriptors and we can see how this type of activity could help our high level students. So it's going to help them with things like constructing coherent sentences, um, especially using like grammar um, words like articles, prepositions and conjunctions. It's very good for getting students to notice those and be more aware of those. Um, it's going to help them combine phrases and sentences into more coherent passages because, again, they have to think about how things are being constructed. Um, and, and how the sort of text makes sense, because they'll be having those kind of discussions with each other when they're looking at the text. And at the band E, um, you know, we're expecting students to develop, to demonstrate full control over use of grammatical conventions. So, you know, making sure that all your, um, all that they're using the right tenses and they're using the right subject verb agreement. And so again, these kind of activities really focus on those details. Um, and again, as I said, this shouldn't be a standalone activity, then then would be some follow up. So you um, you can't rely on uh, on primary learners to, you know, just soak this stuff up and be like, great, I, now I know it and I'm going to go away and use it, which is something we might be able to expect of secondary learners to a greater extent. So we want to follow this up. So 
Um, we want to follow this up with further work on the text. This could, un this could include what we call directed activities related to texts, um, focusing on other elements of the text, such as vocabulary or grammar. Um, you might want to draw their attention to a particular area of the text in terms of its grammar or structure. You could explain or elicit characteristics of the text, which learners could then use a success criteria. Um, and that could then, of course, lead them into writing their own version of the text type, which again is particularly useful for um, things like, um, you know, exam answers or, or things that they or or paragraphs of you know longer things that we're expecting them to create. Okay, so to summarise, um, we've looked at three different um, strategies. Um, that can be, and, and we've looked at different task types and activities that can be used within these strategies. So um, I hope I've demonstrated that it's not really about using new or different activities with these higher level learners. Really, it's about adapting those activities and strategies that we know work with, uh, with, the, with lower levels already um, and adding to the challenge and developing learners' independence as we go along. So um, that brings me to the end of. The, uh, the presentation today um, and it's just hopefully there's a couple of minutes for some questions. Yes thanks very much Tom for a very interesting and I think information packed presentation. Um, as you said if you've got any questions please type them in the chat box. In the meantime there is one question on dictogloss you mentioned mm. but uh, would you say, are there any limitations to the text types you can use Dictogloss with, or are there any text types you'd recommend using with Dictogloss? Um, well, I think the one, what I would recommend is, is any text that, um, for example, ha have lots of good exemplars of a particular language point that you want your students to, to develop. So one example would be, for example, linking, um, using connective words to link paragraphs, you know, like firstly, secondly, or, 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 you know, consequently, these kind of this kind of language appears in more academic texts when they're describing sequences or, or processes. Um, it can work well with those because it kind of it will really it helps them to tune in because what you find when you do a dictogloss is the students are quite good at tuning into the nouns or the key. OK, yep. Yeah. They, he said the word, um, you know, whatever the, the elephant was in there, right? Great, that's fine. All the verbs, because these are very concrete things that students quite easily pick up on. Um, and they're less good at the, the, the smaller, the more grammatical stuff, because it's, you know, that's not as important, I guess, to the um, key, the core meaning, but it's where the nuance comes from, isn't it? It's where the sophistication of the language comes from. So, mm. yeah. Uh, it depends yeah. on what you want your students to focus on, basically. Um, it's, <laughs> it's usually a good idea to reverse engineer it from that point of view. But yeah, I, I agree. It's I think Dictogloss is a brilliant noticing activity, as you say. And mm. uh, again, I think it can be used for academic English as well as a more general language. Um, so certainly, yeah, one to one to try and requires very little preparation as well, which yes, that's another is reason. a it's good, good strategy <laughs> for busy teachers. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, and I think, you know, you don't need to be a language expert to do it. Obviously, it helps if you have an awareness of the language and you can help the students maybe point to different things, but it's not necessary, you know, because there's a noticing activity on its own. It's quite valuable, especially if you've got kind of more proficient learners who are already quite capable and confident um, with, with using language. Okay, thank you very much. I don't think we've got any more questions and it's nearly time to finish. So just before we finish, um, Tom, could you bring up the list of uh, upcoming oh, courses? Can, I've got, yeah. uh, this is some information mm -hmm. here on this screen. You can see um, our online courses, which are coming up in the next uh, months. Um, a range of audiences from EAL coordinators, classroom teachers to teaching assistants. You can find all the information about the courses, but also any upcoming webinars on the Language for Results International website, which I'll put in the in the chat. Um, 
And also, if you would like to be advised of any new training opportunities or resources that we publish, you can also sign up for our newsletter uh, through the website. Um, and also just a quick reminder that you will get an email um, within 48 hours with a link to the video recording of today's webinar. So you can uh, go back to any of the content you might have missed or something that you want to look at again. And we'll also include the links to the resources mentioned in the talk today. Um, when you leave the webinar, a post-course evaluation form will appear and you will also get a link to the same form in the email. And we'd be very grateful if you could spend a few moments um, to complete it so that we can get feedback and inform the development of uh, future webinars. And can, I, can I also ask people to, if you have any suggestions for topics they'd like us to, to go into more detail about or, or give um give information about then let us know because yeah it's good to hear from people on the ground perfect well thank you very much tom thank you very much uh, for taking part in today's webinar and we look forward to seeing everyone again yes thank you everyone thank you very much <laughs> I hope bye. You soon. bye